going to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, while the young people are making their way next door, um, my wife and I were talking early this morning about different books of the Bible, and one of them was the book of Ephesians. And uh, she asked the question, I think maybe somebody had asked her the question, is who, to whom is the book of Ephesians addressed? Well, it is addressed to the church that was at Ephesus. And it is. Everything in that book was written and addressed to the people who were living and part of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a major city at that time in what today would be Greece. But the fact of the matter is, um, every book of the Bible is written to a specific targeted audience but every book of the bible is also written to the world it is god's word to the world and so when god speaks he speaks to specific people groups or sometimes individuals but he also speaks to the rest of us and it's very important that we understand that ephesians chapter 5 is an important chapter and we're going to flow into lord willing chapter 6 for just, just the beginning of it. But before we do all that, I'm, I'm going to give you a little heads up, a little warning. I'm going to say some things this morning that you may not like. I'm going to say some things you may not agree with. I'm certainly going to say some things that aren't going to be popular. I'm not doing this to pick a fight with anybody. I'm not doing this to start an argument with anybody. Not interested in that. But if you'll listen all the way through and you'll pay attention, you'll hear me out. I think by the time we're finished, you're probably going to say, I see where you get that. But when you first hear the statement, you may say, no. But listen all the way through. And I think if you follow along in your Bible particularly, and if you, you follow all the way through, it'll, it'll make sense to you before we're finished. Begin with, let's read verse 32, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. That is our basis. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, the Apostle Paul says, This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your word. I ask that you'll speak to us through it today. Send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. Give me the guidance of the Spirit. Use me today, I pray. Help each of us to have Spirit-filled listening, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit will say to the church in this hour. Once again, Lord, help us to set aside this distraction. Once again, Lord, speak by your spirit to the needs of each heart and mind and life here. Forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your moving and working. And help us, Lord, to be wise applicants of what you reveal to us. Lord, always we pray if there's a soul listening today who doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would open their heart and trust Jesus and be saved. Now, Father, bless us in all we do in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three institutions of authority that God, in His Word, has ordained upon the earth. Let me say that again. There are three institutions of authority that God has ordained upon the earth. The second of those three is that of human government. Human government was the second institution God established upon the earth. Now, the Apostle Paul instructs us on that in Romans 13, 1 to 6, where he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid of the power? Do that which is right, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He is the minister, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers 
attending continually upon this very thing. Many years ago, decades ago, back in the 1980s, I was testifying in federal court. And I testified that the Bible teaches that it's right, the government has a right to issue taxes, and it is right for us as citizens to pay taxes. And the judge said, could you give me the places in the Bible where it says that? I gave him a printout that was about that thick of all the places in the Bible that it says that. So, yes, the Bible says it is right to pay taxes. Well, preacher, I don't like paying taxes. Can I be honest with you? I don't like paying taxes either. You don't pay your taxes? I didn't say that. I pay them. I said I don't like paying them. I don't like paying much of anything. I don't have to. And uh, I think a lot of people are like that. I wouldn't say everybody, but a lot of us are like that. But we do what we're supposed to do. It's not a matter of whether we like it or not. It's a matter of doing what is right. Genesis 21, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Sorry about that. So that is the second institution that God established on earth is that of human government. The third institution of authority that God has ordained upon the earth in his word is the church. Well, I don't, I don't see the church as something of authority. That's a problem in our society today that we don't see the church as something of authority. Are you, you trying to be a dictator to us? Certainly not. Well, where in the Bible does it say such a thing? Well, many places, but let me give you what Peter, who was the most outspoken of all the apostles, Peter is mentioned more often in Scripture than any of the apostles, any of the other apostles, I should have said. And Peter, without question, without doubt, was a pastor. And here's what he wrote, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4. The elders, elders in this case is a synonym for pastors. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now that most of us cannot claim. I don't guess anybody here could. But a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, that means not for money, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, that X's out that dictator idea, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth, fadeth not away. So I told you the second institution God is, gave on earth, ordained on earth, in his word, the second institution of authority is human government. The third institution is the church. Does that leave a question in your mind? What's first? We talked about number two and number three. What's number one? Well, it's number one, first of all, because chronologically it comes first. It comes before, long before the church. It comes before human government. And secondly, it is first because of its importance. It's more important than human government. Really? What could be more important than human government? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to be... Uh, the word I'm looking for, an anar anar anarchist here. Don't believe in anarchy. That is the belief that we shouldn't have any government. Everybody just do whatever they want. There are at least one country I know of in the world right now where that's happening. They basically don't have a government, and it is chaos. And that's what we'd have anywhere. If you just totally do away with government, you'd have chaos. But the first institution of authority that God ordained upon the earth is the family and the home. So what I want to talk to you about this morning is a picture of the home. Throughout the Bible, beginning in Genesis, we're told about God establishing the family and the home. It was his idea. Marriage is God's idea. It's his design. If it, God created marriage, which he did, and he created men and women for marriage, which he did, well, wait a minute, preacher. What do you do with people who are single all their life? Well, the Bible actually talks about that, too. We won't have time to get into all that, but the Bible says a great deal to say about that. Well, you think it's a sin not to be married? I do not think it's a sin not to be married. I don't mean to convey that idea at all. But God designed marriage. 
And because God designed marriage, he gets to define marriage. He designed marriage. He gets to define marriage. And so he did. And so he does. Genesis 1, verses 27, 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, why does it say that in the Bible? Why It says God created man in his own image. Why does it say male and female created he them? Because man here doesn't just mean the male species. It means mankind in general. So that means men and women alike. You mean men are created in the image of God? Yes. And women are created in the image of God? Yes. So is one less in the image of God than the other? No. Absolutely not. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. Who did he bless? Male and female that he created in his own image. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, the last part of that verse, that's Genesis 1, 28, tells us that mankind is to have dominion over nature. I do not think that that means we're to be abusive to nature. I think that that means we are supposed to take care of nature, but we're to have authority over nature. Well, who gave you that authority? God. Where? I just read it to you. Genesis 1, 28. Well, is it anywhere else? Read Psalm 8 when you have time. You'll find it there also and other places. What I'm trying to help you to see is this. The whole idea of authority is God's idea. Why? Because God himself is the ultimate authority. You know what? We human beings, generally speaking... Everybody's different. Not everybody sees things the same way, and we're not ever probably going to see everything the same way. But in general, human beings are a rebellious sort, and we don't like anybody having authority over us. We don't like anything having authority over us because we want to do what we want to do, and we don't want anybody, no matter who they are, what they call themselves, or what their position is, telling us we can or can't do things. That's our nature. But again, if we have no authority, we will have chaos. There has to be authority structure. So God established the home and blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Now that was Genesis 1, 27, 28. Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Now understand, at this point, there was a man. We call him Adam. And this man was the only human being. I started to say the only human being on earth, but that is silly because he was the only human being, period. You mean there wasn't anybody out on the planet Neptune? No, pretty sure there wasn't. So God made man, and you know what God said? He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. Now, what does a help meet mean? Well, let me help you with what a help meet is. Really, we should read it this way. I will make him an help meet for him. In other words, the word meet there doesn't mean, well, I'll meet you on the corner. It doesn't mean that. It means fit for him, one that works for him, one that is designed specifically for him. And so men and women are designed for each other. It's very important to understand that. Now that's again Genesis 2.18. A little later in the same chapter, Genesis 2.24, God says, Therefore shall a man leave, actually Adam was speaking here, he says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. What does that mean? It means she loses her personality and takes on his. No, doesn't say that. It's not what it means, not what it says. But they are united together. They are to work together as a team. They are to work together 
as partners, their work together is more than partners, their work together to carry out the will of God. Now, part of that will of God, we've already said, is to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That's not all of it. That's only a portion of it. But with regard to that, we have to think about children because be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth means to reproduce. I've shared this with you a few times before, but I think it's a good time to share it again. Some years ago, it must be probably eight, maybe 10 years ago now, I read an article and I read articles like this often. I read some just recently in the last few weeks, but uh, all the time uh, you read articles, different parts of the world, they find uh, animals that they either didn't know existed before or they did know they existed before that they thought they were all extinct and then they find some of them living uh, the latest one I read and this is probably three four weeks ago there was a whale I think it was in New Zealand might have been Australia but I believe it was New Zealand had washed up on the beach and prior to this they had found skeletons of this whale but they hadn't seen one with flesh on it before anybody Nobody had seen one with flesh on it, and there was one washed up on the beach there, a species of whale that, that modern man had never seen before. Now, I want to lay something before you just as a matter of thought. Obviously, if they had found skeletons of this animal before, it had existed, and, and it could have been that they were all extinct and if they only found skeletons. That's, that is a possibility. But when you find one with flesh on it, which they did, that tells you that these animals have been living. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And I don't know the age of this whale that they found. I don't think the article estimated an age. If it did, I, I don't remember it. But I guarantee you that whale that they found washed up on the beach was not millions of years old. And yet, modern man had not seen it before. Now keep that in mind. I'm going to tell you this other story. I hadn't told you all this before. I shared it in camp, but not here. But it must be eight, ten years ago, I read an article where somewhere in that same part of the world, Australia, New Zealand, might have been Vanuatu, somewhere in that area, uh, they discovered a species of lizard that they thought previously had been extinct for over a million years. It's found these lizards, not big monsters or anything, just lizards, that they thought had been extinct for more than a million years. And they spent $300,000, I'm sure of some grant, studying, doing a study to determine whether these lizards were re reproducing or not. I don't see anybody reacting the way I did. I laughed when I read that. Why did you laugh? What, how absurd is that, that you spent $300,000 to determine whether these lizards are living or not. Now, if you believe that these lizards have been extinct for over a million years and you see them crawling around, there's only two alternatives. Either A, they're reproducing, or B, you're looking at lizards that are over a million years old. Which one do you think is more likely? Pretty obvious that they're reproducing. I don't need to spend $300,000 to figure that out. You know? Yes, they're reproducing. There they are. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you because reproduction is part of God's plan, and having children is definitely part of God's plan for the home. Well, what about couples that are childless? You know the Bible talks about that too. All these different situations, people who are single for all their life, people who are married but childless, those are not curses from God. Those are not punishments from God. God's will is different for different people. And actually, Jesus addresses those things specifically. But the first, I'm sorry, the fifth, I meant to say the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Read that way. We talk about the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are those Ten Commandments that form the basis of the law as God gave it through Moses. Moses. I say the basis because all the other commandments can come under one of those ten. So they are the premise, they are the foundational commandments for the law of God. Now, as you read through the law that Moses wrote as God gave it to him, there are over 600 commandments. 
And then there are more in the New Testament. Oh, there's no New Testament commandments. Well, you really should read the New Testament again if you think that. I've heard people say that. I've heard preachers say, there are no New Testament commandments. But then in John 13, Jesus says, a new commandment give I unto thee. So that would be a New Testament commandment. And there are others. We're going to look at a couple of them before we're finished this morning, Lord willing. But the fifth of those ten commandments reads this way. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's Exodus 20, verse 12. You'll find it repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 6. But what I'm trying to get across to you here is this. Understand that in the home, the parents are to be the authority. Uh, nobody's telling me what to do. You know, I've, I've known so many young men. Uh, I don't see young women doing this so much, but I've known so many young men in my lifetime who have the attitude, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I do what I want. Nobody's going to boss me around. Nobody's going to tell me what. And you know what I see those guys do? Go join the Marine Corps. You don't want to be told what to do. You don't want to be bossed around. You're going to join the one organization on earth where they are going to boss you around and tell you what to do pretty much every minute of your life for the whole time you're there. You see how logical that is? You don't, do you? No, you don't. Now, I'm not I'm not preaching against the Marine Corps. Don't don't misunderstand me, not at all. I got some Marines in the in front of me right now. And I got Marines in the family. So I'm not talking about the, against the Marine Corps. But I'm telling you, if you don't like to be told what to do, the Marine Corps may not be the place for you. But in the home, it's not the Marine Corps. In the home, the parents are the authority. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. We'll come back to that. Jesus honored marriage with his presence at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. He and his disciples were invited to this wedding and they went. Now, when I was in Nazareth years ago, many years ago, where we were standing in Nazareth, we could see Cana. We did not go to Cana, but we could see Cana from where we were standing. That's much like uh, some years ago I was in El Paso, Texas, and we were up on a mountain, my son and I, and I could see Mexico. We didn't go to Mexico, but you could see Mexico, or at least part of it. Had the same experience in Jerusalem. I was standing in Jerusalem. I could look across the Jordan River and see the country of Jordan. I haven't been to Jordan, but I've seen part of it. So we could stand in Nazareth and see Cana, so it's not that far away. But he went to the marriage in Cana, and that's recorded in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And John tells us he did his first miracle there. And in the first two verses of that passage, that'd be John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus were called, invited, both Jesus were called and his disciples to the marriage. So they were invited to the marriage and they went. And again, there he performs his first miracle. So he very much commended marriage ceremony. Now, they did it differently in that time and place than we do it today. Uh, our traditions are somewhat based on what they did then, but it's, the customs were different. And how were they different? Well, that's a whole discussion by itself. We won't get into it today. But then in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus taught about the sacredness of marriage. And we've lost that concept to a large degree in our country today that, that marriage is a sacred vow before God, and it is. Here's what Jesus said, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore, I'm sorry, yeah, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh, what God hath joined together, let not men put asunder. Put asunder. What does asunder mean? It means to divide in two. If, if you had a ham up here and you took a meat cleaver and you cut it in half, you cut it asunder. That's, that's what it means. So God's plan, for the most part, 
And I say for the most part, because again, we've already said it's not the same for every human being. God's plan is designed to bring children in the world. Marriage is designed to bring children into the world. And I say for the most part, but again, again, God hasn't called everybody to marriage. You know how you find out whether you're, if you're a young person, how you find out whether you're called to be married or not? It's real simple. Number one, most people are called to be married, but not everybody. How do you find out whether you are or not? I'll tell you how. You surrender your heart and your situation totally to God, and you say, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. If you want me to be married, I'll be married. If you don't want me to be married, I'll, I'll be single. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do, and God will show you. He will. Preacher, did you just say some people are called to be single? Yes, I just said that. Some people are called to be single. That's God's will for their life. Not God's will for most people, but it is for some. And it gives us said earlier, that's not a curse. It's not a punishment. It's not like that. Well, what about those who are widowed and so forth? Well, that's all covered in Scripture too. We, again, we can't cover all of these situations, but they're all in the Bible. So God's plan is for children to follow the authority of their parents. And that is the first institution of authority in the human race and upon the planet Earth. Now, let's take a look at the picture of the home. We're going to start Ephesians chapter 5. We read verse 32, but let's go back to verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Tell you what, let us read verse 18 just, uh, just to help the flow of thought there. Ephesians 5, 18, Apostle Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There's no period there, so that's not the end of the thought. But let me help you with what he's saying there. He's drawing a contrast. Be not drunk with wine. Why? Because if you are, you're not thinking as you normally would. And your wine, your intoxication is pretty much in control of you. So he's saying instead of being drunk with wine and letting the wine control you, I, I heard people years ago, I don't hear this much anymore, but uh, when somebody had obviously had a lot to drink and they were talking in a way that they didn't normally talk, and I don't mean being silly or anything like that, uh, one fellow I knew would become very philosophical when he had a lot to drink, and he would just philosophize about pretty much anything and everything. And people would say, that's the liquor talking. Now, I don't hear people say that much anymore, but they used to hear people say, that's the liquor talking. What do they mean? It means that's not how this person usually talks. It's not how this person usually is, but when they're intoxicated, that's how they are. So, he says, be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess? So what's the contrast to that? Be filled with the Spirit, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't let the wine control you. Let the Spirit of God control you. Be surrendered totally to the Holy Spirit of God. Let Him guide your life. Again, that's not the end of the sentence. It's not the end of the thought. The same thought continues, and this is what it's like when you're filled with the Spirit. So watch it. Speaking to yourselves... In Psalms, you have the book of Psalms in the Bible. Did you know that there are Psalms in other books besides the book of Psalms? There are. Mary had a Psalm. Some people call it Mary's Magnificat, but it's a Psalm. And you'll find that in the Gospel of Luke. There are other Psalms in the Bible besides the one in the book of Psalms. What is a Psalm? It's actually a song. And it's a song of worship. Some of them are prayers. But they were always meant to be set to music. Now, why don't we sing all the psalms? Well, we do sing some of them. We don't sing all of them. We don't, the ones we sing, we usually don't sing the whole psalm. Sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't. Well, what tune do we sing it to? Well, we sing it to modern tunes. Why? Because I don't think anybody knows what the original tunes were. They were lost thousands of years ago. And if we'd had the original tunes, which again, I'm pretty well convinced that we don't, but if we had the original tunes, they might sound strange to those of us who've grown up in the Western Hemisphere because ancient Middle Eastern music is very different than modern Western music. And so they might 
be a little hard for you to sing. Could you do it? Yeah, I'm sure you could. But it'd be difficult. It'd be unusual. It wouldn't be what you're used to. Not saying that's bad, not speaking against it, just trying to help you understand why uh, we don't sing the Psalms to the original tune. But the Lord speaks to us and tells us to speak to each other in Psalms and in hymns. Again, a hymn is similar to a psalm, but it's not the same thing. A hymn is a song of worship and spiritual psalms. Now, that's interesting, too, because three different categories of, of songs here, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Aren't they all directed to the Lord? They are. But a spiritual song isn't necessarily a song of worship. Uh, we can sing a spiritual song that's about the Lord, but it's not necessarily directed to the Lord. A hymn is directed to the Lord. We're singing to the Lord. We're worshiping Him. The Psalms may be prayers that we sing, or they may be instructional. Uh, they have different functions. There are the imprecatory Psalms, which are actually prayers against the enemies of God. There are Psalms like that? Yes, there are. So they have their function. So Psalm is different than a hymn. Hymn is different than a spiritual song. Uh, how many of you know the song, I'll Fly Away? Okay, most of you do. It's in the hymn book. We sing it here once in a while, not a lot. I'll tell you a little something about I'll Fly Away. That is not a psalm, and it's not a hymn. What's well, in our hymn book? Sure it is. And there are other songs in our hymn book that aren't technically hymns. Well, should we sing it in church? Yes, we can sing it in church. But I'll Fly Away is a great example of a spiritual song because it's not really directed in praise to the Lord. It's more talking to each other. It's more of a song of testimony. But it's a spiritual song. So it's not bad. It falls into these categories. The psalms, the hymns, and spiritual songs. So he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. What's the last three words? To the Lord. Who are we singing to? To the Lord. I thought I was singing to the audience. I mean the congregation out here. Well, you might be, but we're supposed to be singing to the Lord. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, you mean I can't I can't sing a love song to somebody? Sure you can, but that's not in this category. Not what it's talking about here. So when we're filled with the Spirit, we're singing, uh, speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Still no period. Still part of the same sentence that started, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to give thanks always to God and the Father, and we're supposed to do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you ever wonder why when we pray so often we end our prayer and we say, in Jesus' name? You know why? Because the Bible told us to do that. Jesus himself said to do that. He said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. What did you tell us to do, Lord? Ask in his name. What does Paul tell us here? Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we close our prayer in Jesus' name. Because the Bible told us to do that. Still no period. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, period. Finally, we come to the end of the sentence. Wow, that's a long sentence. How many of you, when you were in, in school, had to diagram sentences in English class? You ever do that? A few of you? A lot of you haven't, I guess, or you forgot about it. Yeah, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Well, how'd you like to diagram that one? It'd take you a while. There are a lot of sentences like that in the Bible. It will go on for several verses. This is one of them. So all of this from verse 18 all the way down through the end of verse 21 is all one thought. It all comes under the heading of be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And this is what it's like when you're filled with the Spirit and you're submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. What does that mean, submitting ourselves one to another? It means that believers are to submit to each other. That means we're to show honor and respect to each other in the fear of God. 
Now, here's another story I've told here many times. I'm going to tell it again. In 2001, we made a trip over to Japan. There were 13 of us went over there. And we spent, uh, I think, about 14 days there, if I remember right. Maybe it was 12. That's been a while. But um, first Sunday we were there. We got there on Saturday. Uh, when we first got there, I did not know that people in Japan do what people in Britain and Bahamas and other places do, that they drove on the other side of the road. I didn't know that. So we got to the airport, and, and when we left the airport, it was, again, a large group of us, and we got on a bus, and the driver pulled out on the road, and, and I thought he went down the wrong side of the road, and I thought, this guy's going to kill us. I really did. I didn't know they, he was on the road side he was supposed to be on. But that was Saturday. Sunday morning, I was had the privilege of preaching in the Minakami Baptist Church in Minakami, Japan, and I preached through an, an interpreter, or as Dr. Parker used to call him, an interrupter. And, and why is that? Listen, you, you ever do that? If you ever have to speak to an interpreter, everything you say has to get said twice. So you can only say half as much. So spoke through an interpreter. And afterwards, uh, after the service, if it was in this room, it would have been right over there in that aisle between the pews and the windows there. Uh, I was introduced to a man who I was told was the the newest member of the church. He had not long been a believer. He was a new member of the church. And this man was in his 80s. And in Japan, we found at, at that time in 2001, I suppose it's still this way there. I don't know. I've only been there once since then and just for a very short time. But the young people didn't hold so much to the customs that the older people did. Their traditions, I should say. But the older people still did, and they would bow. And the tradition was that you, the one you want to show, who wants to show honor to the other bows the lowest. So this man, I wanted to show him honor because of his age. He was in his 80s. And so I tried to bow lower than him. He wanted to show me respect because I was sensei. It has nothing to do with martial arts. That's what they call pastors and teachers in, in Japan. So I was sensei, and he was an elderly man. So we wanted to show, and, and we bowed, and we, we kept going, trying to get, and we both got all the way down the floor. And everybody thought that was funny, and we did too. And we had a good laugh over it. And that was fine. What were we doing? Showing honor to each other, submitting ourselves one to another. Me to him because of his age, he to me because of my position, but we were submitting ourselves one to another. Neither one of us stood up and said, okay, you bow to me. I'm not bowing to you, you bow to me. Neither one of us did that. And that would have been extremely rude to do anyway. We didn't do that. We got down trying to outbow each other, trying to get lower, not higher, lower than the other one. That's what it means when it says submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Now, here's where we're going to get in trouble. The next statement. Before we read the next statement, verse 22, understand the Apostle Paul is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he gives us here the authority structure of the home and, if you'll stay with it, the meaning of that structure, the why behind it. Look at verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves under your own husbands as under the Lord. Me? Obey Him? Are you out of your mind? No, well, I might be, but that's not what's causing this. Wives, submit yourselves under your own husbands, not anybody else's, under your own husbands as under the Lord. Hmm. It's saying the wife is to follow the leadership of her husband as she would follow the leadership of the Lord. I want to tell you something. When I was in school studying for the ministry, we had a phrase for verses like this. The phrase is, that's easy preaching, it's hard living. And it is. It's real easy to stand up here and say that. It's a lot harder to actually do it. Well, why should I do that? Again, stay tuned. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Stop right there. That's not right. 
I don't accept that. I don't agree with that. You don't have to agree with that. But I understand you're not disagreeing with me. These are not my words. You're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with God's word. Well, that was written thousands of years ago and things have changed. Things have changed. There's a saying I heard years ago that says, somebody said times have changed. Fellow said times have changed. People haven't. And I'm going to tell you that's, that's a fact. Times have changed. People haven't. People today are just like people were thousands of years ago. I could prove that to you. We don't have time. We'll move on. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Period. The husband is the head of the wife. God's purpose here is to picture our acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church and the Savior of the body. It is not for a man to say, listen here, I'm bigger and stronger than you, and you're going to do what I tell you, and you're going to like it, or I'm going to make you like it. That's not it. Not what's being said here at all. And if that's the attitude you have, you got it wrong. It's not what this passage is about. What is it about? Well, stay with me. The husband is the head of the wife. God's purpose here to show is to picture our acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus as the head of the church and the Savior of the body. You're in Ephesians chapter 5. Look back, and if your Bible's like mine, it may or may not be, but uh, you don't even have to turn the page, but look back at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Same book, same author, writing the same audience. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The head. The head of what? Well, actually the head of everything, but in this context, the head of the church. Are you sure that's what it means? Yes. How do you know? I read the rest of the passage. But not only that, listen to the same writer, Apostle Paul writing to a different church, church in Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul wrote regarding the Lord Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. That's pretty plain, isn't it? And he is the head of the body, the church, who, Jesus Christ, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He's to be the head in all things, but he is the head of the church. In all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. That's Colossians 1.18. You get over to the third chapter and it says, In him, uh, no, in, in chapter 2 it says, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Third chapter, I believe it is. What does that mean? Godhead is Trinity. In Jesus Christ bodily is all of the Trinity. Pretty clear. Now look at verse 24. Therefore, because of everything that's been said so far, therefore, as the church is subject under Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in most things. Is that what it says? It's not what it says, is it? What does it say? Everything. Now, how in the world does God expect us to do that? As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their husbands and everything. Because our home is supposed to picture the relationship between the believer and Jesus Christ, between the church and Jesus Christ, and by extension, the relationship of the Trinity with each other. Now, that's not the main thrust of this passage, but the idea is included there. Now, before you say, well, I don't agree with that, stay with me. Let's finish the passage. The idea here is that the family should again be a picture of the relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and the church. And how is it a picture of the Trinity? Let me give this to you. The Father pictures our Heavenly Father. The children picture the Son. And the Mother pictures the Holy Spirit of God. Why did God design it that way? To present us a continual picture of Himself. But that's not all. See, a lot of men like verses 22 to 24. They like that. They, a lot of men like to show that to their wives. They say, see here. Look at this. Look at this. 
Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Boy, they like that. But you got to read the next verse. You've got to put everything in context. Verse 24 is a commandment. A while ago, we said there are New Testament commandments. Here's one of them. Here's a commandment. Husbands, be a good idea, and it doesn't say that. Husbands, let me make a suggestion to you. It doesn't say that either. It says, husbands, love your wives, comma, not the end of the thought. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands are commanded to love their wives, but that's not all. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So a husband is commanded to love his wife the same way Jesus Christ loves the church. Well, how is that? Well, let's finish the verse. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. A husband is commanded in Scripture to love his wife as much as Jesus Christ loves the church, and that means he loves her to the point that he would give himself for her. He doesn't look at her as some inferior person or object or thing. He doesn't look at her as less than himself. He looks at her as the one for whom he would give his very lifeblood and his life itself if need be. And not like the fellow I heard about years ago. He was interested in a young lady. And they, they certainly weren't married. But he wrote her a note. And the note said, For you I would swim the deepest river. I would climb the highest mountain. I would cross the largest desert, and I'll see you tomorrow night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> Not talking about that kind of thing. Not talking about it. Why does Christ love the church? Well, because He loves us. And we are the church. Now, as we said, men really like verses 22 to 24, but they won't stop at the end of verse 24. 25 gives us the reason for a woman who is every bit as much created in the image of God as the man is to follow the leadership of her husband. Genesis 1, 28 again, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Who's created in the image of God? Male and female. It's what the Bible says. So a woman could, in most cases, would submit to the leadership of her husband if he loves her as Christ loves the church. Gentlemen, that's our duty. That's our command from God, to love her like Christ loves the church. How does Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for it. Acts twenty seventeen. the apostle Paul called for the elders Again, sending him for pastor of the church at Ephesus. Same people to whom he wrote this letter. This Acts 20.17 takes place afterwards. In Acts 20.17, Paul calls for the elders of the church at Ephesus. He knew he was never going to see them again face to face. And in verse 28, Acts 20.28, 20, Paul said to the elders, the pastors at Ephesus, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which... The Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. Well, when did God purchase the church with his own blood? Well, Peter answers that question for us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. How are the members of the church redeemed by the blood of Christ? Now, again, your Bible should be open to Ephesians, or if you're looking on a tablet or a phone, you should be able to find this very easily. Go back to chapter 1, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, and look at verse 7, Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption 
through his blood. Now, whom is a pronoun? It refers to Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Well, how do you know it means Jesus Christ? Because I read the first six verses. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. How do we have redemption? Through his blood. How do we have the forgiveness of sin? Through his blood. So how did Christ give himself for the church? He shed his blood for the church to redeem us, to make us fit to be part of the family of God. So when a man loves his wife as much as Jesus loves the church, that is to say so much that he would shed his blood for her, die for her if need be, then, then she can trust him enough to follow his leadership because she knows that he has her best interest at heart. Now, is that true of all men? No. Not all men have their wife's best interest at heart. And that's sad, but that's God's plan. That's the way it's supposed to be, gentlemen. So again, look at the beginning of verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Not a suggestion, not a good idea, commandment. So if we would love our lives as Christ loves the church, we would have much happier homes. Someone's going to say, well, you don't live with the man or the woman that I live with. That's true. That's true. And every situation is different because every individual is different. We all have different situations. We all have different circumstances. The Bible's not telling you, listen to me, the Bible's not telling you to change the person you married so that they'll be the way they're supposed to be. It's not telling you that. The Bible is telling you to be the person you're supposed to be. It tells you to do that so that you may be a picture of Christ in the church. And you know what else it says? It says you may, it doesn't say you will, it says you may win your other, your spouse over by being the person you're supposed to be. Where does it say that? First Peter chapter 3. Now it was verse 26. Let's go back to 25 to get flow of thought for 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's not expressly stated in the Bible. Let me say that again. This is not expressly stated in the Bible. This is more a tradition. But the tradition is based on the verses we just read. This is why traditionally in a Christian wedding, the bride wears a white gown. Why? Because she represents the church that he sanctified and cleansed with washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's why a bride wears a white dress. And the reason, traditionally speaking, and, and if you go to church and I have that this doesn't have this, don't say, oh, that's the wrong church. No, you're thinking wrong. If you, you're not getting what I'm telling you if you think that. The reason traditionally churches have a center aisle is primarily for weddings. Now, while preacher, I know a long time ago, the men all sat on one side and the ladies all sat on the other side. And that's true. In some places, some cultures, they still do that. But going back to the wedding tradition, when they had a marriage in the church, in the Old Testament, a covenant, they would walk between, the people made a covenant would walk between witnesses. So myself and somebody else made a covenant, we'd walk between witnesses. So you have a center aisle, so you have witnesses on one side and on the other side. And that's why traditionally, again, this is all tradition. You're not going to find scripture for all this. It's based on scripture, but you won't find verses specifically saying this. The friends of the bride, friends and family of the bride sit on one side, friends and family of the groom sit on the other side because they are the witnesses to the covenant that the couple is making. So it's all symbolic. Now, well, if I have my wedding and I don't do it exactly that way, am I wrong? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying if you don't do it that way, you're wrong. I'm telling you why those traditions were ever started in the first place. 
But verse 26 again, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. What he's telling us here is we ought to love her like we love ourselves. Well, where do you get this, that that's the bride of Christ and so forth? Well, how about Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Symbolic. Symbolic. Well, I know this lady got married in a blue dress. Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. You mean she's just as married? Just as married. You mean she's just as good as somebody wore a white dress? Absolutely. We're talking about tradition here. But there's a basis for the tradition. So ought men to love their wives, their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. In other words, you take care of yourself, men. Take care of your wife. You get hungry, make sure she has something to eat. You get cold, make sure she has something to wear. You're tired, make sure she has a place to rest. Take care of your wife like you take care of yourself. Why? Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then verse 31. For this cause... Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. You heard that before you have twice this morning. You heard it in Genesis where Adam said it. You heard it in Matthew 19 where Jesus said it. And now Paul says it again in Ephesians 3. Listen, if a verse appears in the Bible one time, it's God's word. So it's important. But if three of the most prominent characters in the Bible, Adam, Jesus, and Paul, all say the same thing, God's trying to tell us something. We need to sit up and take notice. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And then back where we started, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know what that is? When a husband loves his wife like Christ loved the church, she'll reverence him. She will. Why? Because she knows that he would do anything and everything he can for her. No limit. Well, I wish I had a husband like that. Yeah, I know. I wish our men were all like that. Are all men like that? No. I know men are terrible and they're just awfulest creatures that were ever made and they'd be better off without them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. So that's the picture. Great mystery. Mystery here means a new truth. Speak concerning Christ and the church. The home and the family is to be a picture of of Christ in the church. Now go to chapter 6. We're finished. Verses 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Clear statement. Children, obey your parents, for this is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That phrase in the Lord is important, not only because it's part of God's word, but because it's part of understanding what's being said here. Suppose, and I've heard of horrible things like this, suppose one of your parents, your father, your mother, tell you go commit a crime. Should you do that? No. But it says obey your parents. Yes, in the Lord. Is the Lord going to tell you to go commit a crime? No. See, Peter talks about this after he and John had been arrested and, and put in jail for preaching, preaching in the name of Jesus. And they said, we'll let, you, we'll let you go. All you have to do is agree that you'll never mention Jesus around here again, and you'll be fine. Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than men. He didn't say we're not going to obey the authority. He didn't say, well, you, buddy, you listen, you can't tell me what to do. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. 
He just said we have to obey the higher authority. The lady I knew, she's been here many times in the church, not never was a member of the church, been here many times. She was uh, in the district attorney's office for many years, retired from that. And she told me that uh, she wanted to go out with, uh, I think it was Delray Police, might have been another agency in the county here. She said uh, she wanted to go out with them for a ride along. And that's acceptable, that's done. But her supervisor said to her, that's fine for you to do that, but know this. Any situation you come upon, you now are the senior law enforcement officer on that scene. Oh, she hadn't counted on that. Didn't think that was part of it. Well, what made her the senior law enforcement officer? Did she go to the police academy? No. She studied law, obviously. Well, what her position as being in the district attorney's office? Authority. Authority. Obeying the higher authority. So who is the senior law enforcement officer in this case? God. He's the senior law enforcement officer. Are you legalist? No. So children are commanded, like husbands are commanded, obey your parents and the Lord, but this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. It says, which is the first commandment with the with promise. What is the promise? Verse 3, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long upon the earth. Said this here many times. You honor your parents, you'll live longer. Longer than what? Longer than you'll live if you don't honor your parents. It's that simple. Not hard to understand. Verse 4, and ye fathers. There it is, picking on the men again. Why? If you're going to be the head of the house, you get the responsibility. Jesus said, unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't pick at your children and make them angry just for the point that you can do it. Don't do that. But bring them up in the nurture. Nurture is an interesting word. According to W.E. Vine's expository dictionary of the Bible, nurture here means instruction, discipline, correction. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition, exhortation, encouragement, and rebuke of the Lord. That means we're supposed to bring them up right. We're supposed to bring them up to respect authority. We're supposed to bring them up to respect not only our authority, but other authority as well. It says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So husbands must love their wives. Wives in turn must l learn to love their husbands. Where does it say that? Titus 2, verses 3 and 4. And then the children will love the father that does not provoke them, but that nurtures them and gives them admonition. Now, what I just spent all this time describing to you is the ideal situation in the home and the family. And that is a wonderful testimony of love, our love for each other, our love for God and his love for us. But everybody sitting here today and everybody who hears me knows that all our homes and families are not always ideal. Why? Because we are human beings, we have a sin nature, and we don't always do things the ideal way. But we also know that God gives us grace. Having a godly home is not automatic. I'm a Christian, my wife's a Christian, we're going to have a godly home. There's more to it than that. It's not automatic. It takes thought, time, effort, prayer. It takes surrendering our will to God's will. It takes considering the other person, how they feel. It takes communication. It takes consideration. It takes doing away with selfishness and self-centeredness. takes all of that and more. But I'm going to tell you, it's worth it. Well, preacher, what am I going to do? I, things have not worked out for me. Well, first of all, let me tell you, my heart goes out to you. It does, and I mean that sincerely. I'm not saying, well, it's all your fault. If you'd done everything you were supposed to do, everything would have been fine. Can I share something with you? I've known cases where at least one 
person in the marriage did everything they were supposed to do, but the other person just didn't. It didn't work out. You don't blame that one who did everything right. We submit ourselves to the Lord. We individually, as individuals, commit ourselves to growing by reading, meditating, and memorizing His words, committing to live by His word, praying, and trying to get closer and closer to being the people and the family that God would have us to be. You and I cannot make other people do right. We cannot mold them into who they should be. We need to make sure we're who we are, what we're supposed to be. That's what we can do. Now, there's opposition to everything I've talked about today. There is. And it has a satanic root. Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, one of the things that Satan is trying to devour today is homes and families. And why is that? Because the home and the family is the basic structure of society. Came before human government. Came before the church. It's the basic structure of society. Those who deny our Lord Jesus Christ want to destroy that picture of our relationship to Him and His people. That picture of the Trinity. There is a satanic effect effort to attack and destroy families and homes, mothers and fathers, children. What are we going to do about it? Well, you and I, first of all, must determine to obey our Lord and with His help, be the men and women, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers and children He wants us to be. Secondly, we must understand that we cannot mold the other person into the image of Christ. We can only surrender ourselves to Him. And let him mold us into his image. Well, what if I've, I've already had an impossible situation that happens? You're still under God's grace. You still live for him. You still trust him and you still follow him. Sometimes you don't have a choice in the matter. Let me share this with you. I'm closing. All of us have people in our life who pass away. And we miss them. We don't want them to be gone. We want them to still be here with us. How do you live with that? I'm going to tell you what you do. Number one, there's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to change that. It's happened. It's not what you wanted. You would change it if you could, but you can't. So number one, you have to accept the fact that you can't change what has happened. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to miss that person. That doesn't mean you're not going to care about them anymore. That doesn't mean you're not going to think about them. doesn't mean you're not going to still love them. doesn't mean any of that. It means you can't change the unchangeable. That's first step. What's second step? Determine that you're going to go on with your life. How do you do that? One step at a time. Following the Lord, asking for His help, leaning upon Him, one step at a time. You keep taking that next step, and you're going to make it. You are. Not easy. But the great news is you don't have to do it alone. I feel like I'm alone. You will sometimes. You know, I'm pretty sure Daniel felt alone in the lion's den, but he wasn't. We go through things that aren't what we want, not what we'd choose at all. But you have to keep going. God, I can't make it anymore. Yes, you can. Lord, I need you. You certainly do. You rest upon Him. You strengthen your faith. You grow in your faith. And you lean on Him and you do what you have to do. Father, thank You so much for loving us. Thank You for all that You've given us in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to realize Your precious promises such as I will never leave Thee nor forsake Thee. 
Lord, help us take an honest look at ourselves. Are we the people who we should be? Are we representing you as we should be? Are we the people at home that we should be? And Lord, if the answer to all those questions is yes, we still need to know and understand that we can't control other people. We can pray for them, and we should. We can help them, and we should. But we cannot control them. But Lord, we pray that each of us would seek to know you, love you, and serve you, and be the person who best represents Christ to this lost and blind world. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. There are no strangers here this morning. God's spoken to your heart. There's a spiritual need in your life. I'm going to step down front. I'd be glad to meet you there. Pray with you. Maybe share a word of scripture with you. Help you with a decision that you need to make. All of that. If you're not saved, you're not sure about it, you come. You are saved. You've got another decision you need to make. Come. You just need prayer. You come. However God speak into your heart, this is your opportunity to respond. Father, bless and move now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.